driving aids or driving assistance programs. You're hearing more and more about it with different branding from every company. They're all telling you, or some of them are telling you that they're capable of fully autonomous driving. And in this video, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about that driving around in Cadillac's Escalade with their Super Cruise driving assistance package. Now to understand some of this, you have to understand the different levels of driving assistance. And it goes at this point from level one to level five where level one and two require your input, require your attention. There's kind of an in-between two plus that allows you to take your hands off the wheel and the car will do some automated tasks like speed up, slow down, take control of the steering wheel without you touching the steering wheel, but it requires you looking ahead by using eye tracking sensors or motion tracking sensors, and it's making sure that you're alerted. So right now we're basically maxed out in the consumer layer around level three. And Mercedes is a level three program and other companies are probably gonna say they're ha they have level three where you don't have to pay attention to the road in front of you where it doesn't require eye tracking. But the gimmick there is it doesn't let you drive above a certain speed. And the speed is arbitrary. You know, a company can make it 35 miles an hour, they can make it 55. So where we're at is maxed out right now really in level three. Now Tesla says they have full self-driving, which as we've seen and we know, this isn't necessarily aligned with reality. It's a lot harder to get a car that drives itself completely from point A to point B, getting off on highways, doing the stops it needs to do, doing it safely, and then allowing you just to sit there and take your pants off and give yourself a body bath. We're not there and we're not gonna be there for a long time. But in, in this drive segment, really what you're gonna to start to see is how are some of these assistance programs working? And then kind of a philosophical debate on them. Green arrow means go, Jack. What does the tollway mean, Mark? The tollway means go 200 miles an hour on this. What's the max speed? I don't know. 112, 115. We're in a big boy. We're in the Escalade. So you talked a little bit about like Super Cruise and the technical part of all of this. So let's get into it, Jack. We're driving. So I'm going to activate Super Cruise, Mark. I have my adaptive cruise control on, and I'm on a highway that has been geocached by Super Cruise and General Motors. Now Super Cruise is activated, Mark, so I can go hands free. So let's, let's, let's talk about hands free for right. a minute. Tell me what that means, because there's all these levels of autonomy nobody understands, and nobody really gets what is what, so what is it? Hands-free, at least the way I understand it, is a purely assistance level grade of, of driver aid, meaning it is doing things for you, but you have to monitor it. This is not, I can get in the back seat and go to sleep, I'm not in a transportation pod, I'm still in an automobile, which is run by tech, and tech often has issues. So even though this is doing a lane change for me, because this Highlander is doing 10 miles an hour underneath the speed limit. Highlander, oh, this Highlander. Yeah, this okay. Highlander in this front of me is doing 10 miles an hour underneath the speed limit. I still have to monitor it. So, I mean, you, your BMW that you own, your X7 has something similar. But much like the BMW, this has similar systems to monitor your attention as well. It's, it's looking at what? My eyes. Okay. So there's this beam up here is putting an, eye, an IR light on my eyeballs. There's a camera right above the Cadillac badge on the steering wheel, and it's constantly monitoring what I'm doing. So if I'm trying to create the, the latest TikTok video on my phone, it will turn off and my seat will buzz. The seat will buzz as well when it's going to turn left or right to get around someone moving slower than you. Okay. And it'll, it'll vibrate either my left or right cheek accordingly, Mark. Now, does it actively go around traffic or do you always have to have your turn signal? So if I'm behind someone in the right lane and they are going too slow or slower than the, the, the speed that I have set, it will go around. Uh, so and then it, it, it'll see that they're going too slow and I'll move over to the left. But I guess back to the conversation, what do these systems you think mean here and now to people like you or I who you know will be in a position who are in a position to buy a vehicle with something like this equipped so what this is is it's a stress reducer assistance system right I mean it's it's for those who drive a lot that are on highways that clearly are set up for this type of technology to have a higher level of success like this is a great environment where this system can work and be helpful 
and it takes the edge off of driving where you're not completely having to be hands-on and being fatigued in traffic all the time. If you have the money for one of these systems, at least in the Cadillac's case, it works very well. In the case of the BMW, if you're crawling in traffic like when I used it in Chicago, it, it, in stop and go traffic, it's amazing. It, it takes the probably 50% of the fatigue off of driving and that's where this is great. I have no problem with this. However, the thing is, is it has its limitations and it only works on certain roads like this, of course, that are straight shots, that are perfectly lined, that there's no turns or obstacles or tra cross traffic coming through. There's not gonna be some baby stroller rolling across the road unless it falls off some like pickup from 50 years ago, you know? <laughs> like it's, it's really controlled. And when we talk about full autonomy, and we had a bit of a conversation about this already, and I did a video on autonomous cars and how they're kind of a scam. A lot of it has been over-promised and under-delivered. They've made it sound a lot more simple than like it Tesla. is. Like Tesla. Like Tesla. And it's, it's not that their technology and hardware is not good. It's just a lot of their marketing is really bad. They're not honest about what it can and can't do. And I think a lot of these companies have started over the past five years really realizing that there are massive limitations of what software and hardware can do combined with existing affordable technology of LiDAR, radar, you have the camera systems that are not, you know, the camera systems are, you got to put a lot of them on a car. So they're not going to spend a thousand dollars on each camera. So that means it's not going to have the best photo sensitivity or light sensitivity, best exposure, best uh, camera lenses. They're still, <laughs> they're still lenses yeah. so they're subject to dirt dust snow salt blockages bright light if you have a dirty lens on light and you shine a light through it you blind out that camera and the system can't work so you have all these mechanical issues with trying to read ahead and look around you and you're trying to take a car that's trying to be semi-autonomous or autonomous and putting them with human drivers on roads never designed like yesterday yeah. we were driving through michigan to go to a car unveil and the gentleman in the on ramp we had no idea what it he was, was a blind do. on ramp. Yep. literally you can't see the ramp coming up so as a human driver we couldn't even anticipate that guy's move or what the out was how is a computer system going to be able to read ahead you know down that ramp and make that judgment to make call. that judgment the thing is is it just can't do that it can't handle the complicated situations that's where human intervention is always going to be now how you fix it and this is why this is never going to happen for a long time, at least in the United States, is we talk about connected cars in our Toyota video, and we talk to Microsoft about HPC and connected cars. The way you would have to do autonomous driving currently is every car would have to be connected to the internet, it would have to be cloud connected, and there would have to be standardization across all companies, all cloud providers, where that GMC is connected to this car where they can talk back and which forth. Which is connected to a Honda, which is connected, connected to a Ford. Yes, where they know geolocation, GPS coordinates, and real-time GPS coordinates, which means now you're, <laughs> you're relying on satellite communication. They're gonna need to know proximity data. They're gonna need to know temperature, speed. All of these things are gonna be hap have to happen in real time between these two cars to really understand what's happening. Then you're gonna have to add uh, fail-safe technology that means redundant 4G or 5G connectivity or whatever the future is. So you're not dropping internet connections to the cloud yes. so that system works. You're going to have to have redundant cameras, LiDAR, and then the worst part about all of that is you're going to need all the processing and you're going to need to also have government and the, the legislative part or regulations part mandating that we have roads that are set up just for autonomous driving. Or a single lane. Yes. Basically cars at that point have to be, not cars, but transportation pods. This technology, Super Cruise and things like this, as we talked about early, are purely just a driving aid. While they have made this conversation really easy, I've had to pay minimal attention to the right, road, yeah. but I still have to pay attention. It's not doing everything for me all the time. And I think autonomous cars, you know, this idea that Tesla sold to some of their customers and some of the other OEMs have, at least to my knowledge, and you and I are in and out of a lot of cars, yeah. that doesn't exist. No, it's, it's science fiction. And it's science fiction for the very reasons that we talked about, is that, is that the technology is so complicated 
and what it takes to make this work is so far over normal people's heads that they're never gonna grasp all the ins and outs. So all you can really talk about is like, this is why it doesn't work. And these are the hurdles and obstacles to get to full self, full autonomous driving. And you need it from the top up, top, I'm sorry, top down, from government mandating lanes and setting up highways for this. And you need to get human traffic, manual us driving like a sports car at 150 miles an hour out of those autonomous lanes and get rid of them completely, which is almost completely impossible in this country. Yeah, we haven't been able to do it for our semi-trucks right. and our trucking lanes. I have no idea how we're thinking that's gonna be possible for mainstream automobiles. And I think the, the last thing we we'll talk about, Mark, is we talk about how cars are becoming less analog, less connected. A lot of it, sadly for us, like, you know, we joked about in our live stream, why can't cars have manual steering? Well, if cars have manual steering, they couldn't do this. Right. That, and that, that's, that's your, you're right. You know, you do, to have the technology and the safety systems in these cars requires all the EPS units, multi-motor, and uh, all brake the by brake wire. by wire. Yeah. Yep. So the, the car can actually take over and do the assistance stuff that people claim that they want. But, you know, for the people like us, and probably that small percentage of people that are going to watch this that really like that driving experience and want to understand it, the, the very technology they're putting in here to make people safer is also taking away the fun and engagement of driving. You can have one or the other at this yep. point. You can't have both. Yeah, for but, sure. But Mark, I think it's time for us to wrap up this little conversation, sir. Yeah, where the hell are we? I have no idea. <laughs> I think we're like yeah, super cruising <laughs> cruises us into oblivion. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be like 45 minutes away now. I know this was a long, huge discussion about the future, the pitfalls, but here's the pros. The Super Cruise system works great because it's set up to work great on divided highways. So if you're on a road trip, you're going to, from Illinois to Florida or Florida to California, or you're on a divided highway the entire time, you can literally do nothing except pull over for fuel or a charge or whatever you're going to do with it. So in that regard, it works very, very well because they're not over overcomplicating it. The road systems are vetted and then up sent to the car for updates to allow you to use it. I like that part of it. So what's the negative? Well, it doesn't work all the time. And I would say it's like, it all it takes is that one time for it not to work and you're in a world of hurt. It's like if you're wearing a condom 99 out of 100 times, you're having intercourse and that one time you don't and now you got warts, you got three kids on the way. You're in, you know, you're gonna be in trouble. And that's why you constantly have to do your due diligence in a system like this. And in the case of Super Cruise, it did make a mistake once. It went switching to a middle lane and there was an Equinox coming in our blind spot that it didn't see and we would have merged into each other. Jack took over the wheel, grabbed the wheel and turned in the spot and it never saw that car. Now, you know, that that's the biggest problem with stuff like this and the fact that companies are not accepting liability for accidents or anything like that. So it's on you completely to pay attention, even though it lulls you into the false sense of security that it's got you covered. Uh, and we saw this with Tesla's bright light, like on a sun, sunny day on a sunset where bright lights directly on a sensor, the system freaks out. We've seen Hyundai and Kia's just like think there's uh, you're crossing over a lane and you're not. Uh, the Toyota systems are even worse with that. It, it constantly thinks you're lane deviating and it doesn't. And some of these semi-autonomous systems do similar things in adverse conditions. My BMW literally slammed on the brakes for no reason on the highway and came to a dead stop because it thought there was a ghost object in front. And there's traffic coming up behind. So it's, it's these systems, you put a lot of faith in them, but you still have to mind them. You still have to pay attention. And that's why they're not really autonomous. I don't care what brand it is. And we're a long way away from that. The other fine print of this in the case of Super Cruise, and I asked GM this, what happens if you lose a data connection? Because the car is always connected to the internet. It's always uploading and receiving data from their cloud infrastructure. You lose data connection, Super Cruise will stop. You have to take over the car. Or if you don't respond, it will literally try to part, go pull over itself and stop the car um, and let you know that your service has been disconnected. Or if your subscription ends, Super Cruise will no longer work. It requires an active data connection and an OnStar connection because if you have a problem, let's say you Super Cruise is act activated, you take your hands off the wheel, you turn your head or you fall asleep and it can't track eye data, it can't track head movement, it's gonna prompt you a ton of different ways, vibration, tones, lights, all of that. If you don't respond to that, it will pull over the car 
OnStar will get in, call you in the car and see if you need emergency services. So that system works hand in hand and it has to be there. It's free for the first three years. After that, you're on your own. It's another cell phone bill essentially. And you're handing over all your private data. You're handing over the car's usage habits, what you're using on the screen, where you're going, what you're doing, GPS coordinates, speed, all the relevant information is going to the cloud for GM to tear through that data and use it to improve their services. They also will sell it to third party data collectors and data miners. So there's no way to opt out of it. And most car companies are doing the same way for services like that. So that's the fine print of this. But if you don't know anything about privacy, you pretty much let people hijack all your information on social media. It's all searchable or it's all obtainable through the right parties at this point anyway. So, you know, what's your priorities? And that's just that. I would say we're a long way away from that level four, level five, where you take your hands off the wheel and just, you know, doing nothing in the car because we still have that mixed human traffic that the computer systems today cannot account for on mixed highways. And as long as we have that, I don't care who's doing the software design, what sensors you have, uh, it's never gonna work perfectly and we're always gonna have to babysit these cars. And that's, at least in 2022, that's the overwhelming feeling. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next video.